Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm in kind of an odd situation because here I am at a Python conference and I'm going to be talking about a language that is not Python. Uh, but uh, as, as I'll explain, we're, we're, we're using Python a lot and benefiting from Python a lot in order to, to allow us to, 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 to bootstrap a new language, which is always a difficult thing to, thing to do. And, and also, I think the nature of the language, uh, uh, which is called Julia, will make it interesting, I think, to a lot of, uh, a lot of Python uh, developers. So, so where I'm coming from, I, I'm in applied mathematics, and I do technical computing, scientific computing. And I, I, technical computing, I would include scientific computing, statistics, uh, optimization, modeling, machine learning, uh, that kind of thing, as, as opposed to databases or web servers, which I wouldn't count as, as technical computing. And if you look in that space, uh, which has you know, historically been a big driver for, for computing, the, the very first compiled language, it's not even written there, the very first compiled language was uh, uh, Fortran, which was developed uh, in, you know, initially for scientific computing. And uh, uh, there's been a lot of, a surprising number of languages aimed specifically at this space. So you, I'm not even counting Fortran because nowadays that's considered a general purpose programming language, although really it's only used for technical computing. And just almost 50 languages, and uh, 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 arranging, you know, uh, uh, from, uh, you know, they're, they're on, sort of traditionally divided into two categories. There's the ones that are aimed at high performance, like Fortran, but nowadays more modern ones like Fortress, which just sort of died, Zippel and Chapel and so forth. And you've never heard of these because they've all failed. Um, and ones that are more aimed at productivity. And the most famous one of these is, is MATLAB. Uh, which is the, sort of the, the grandfather of them all, but nowadays there's lots of them, including GNU R, uh, and uh, well, Python with, with SciPy or Ruby with, with, with uh, SciRuby, and so, so on and so forth. And so, uh, you know, there's a question of why, why is it necessary to have so many languages? And it, it, it's, it's part because of some unusual features of the technical computing space, where you're combining a, a real need for high performance. I mean, people use 10,000 processors. They drive really large problems with a need for constant experimentation, which favors uh, uh, interactive environments like MATLAB and Python and IPython and so, and so forth. And, and also, they tend to have very complex vocabularies and a lot of other features that aren't, aren't typical. Uh, and another funny thing about this space is that domain-specific languages are extremely common. So I was at Euro SciPy last year, and it seems like every other talk, they talk, they you know for, for finite element methods or for you know all sorts of things. Every other talk had a domain-specific language. Every other talk said, oh well, we we. we you specify this part of the problem symbolically, and we generate a symbolic graph of the, of the computation, and we do transformations, and we spit out C++ code. And it, 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 in order to, basically in order to combine these very complex vocabularies, experimentation with, with high performance. And so the, the, this, this, this dichotomy of having two languages has is, is, is been with us for a long time. And it's, it's kind of a problem. So, I mean, the, the general strategy is you write, you start with a high level language, that you, and you want that that you can work with interactively for easy development and prototyping exploration. So, that, that leads you towards dynamically typed languages like Python and MATLAB and R and, Sci and Scilab. Uh, some of us even like Scheme. Uh, but, you know, historically, you can't write your performance critical code, your inner loops in those languages. So for those inner loops, you have to switch to some other languages, typically C or Fortran, or general static languages. I mean, Go, Go and Rust are also static languages, which you can't really use uh, interactively in the same way you could use Python. So, and so for example, SciPy is mostly written in, about 70% of it is written in C and C++ and Fortran. And, and this is workable. We've all done it in scientific computing. I know I like C. I program a lot in C. But, you know, it, it's a huge jump in complexity to go from Python to, to Python plus C, or Python plus, plus, Cypon, uh, plus uh, Cython, for example. Now, one response that you often hear to this is, well, if you're using MATLAB or NumPy or something like that, you can always get good performance, just, just vectorize your code. Right? So write your code in terms of vector operations, and then it will be fast. And what they're really saying is that as much as possible, you should, you should rely on, on mature external libraries for your performance-critical code. Uh, um, 
that, you know, where you pass them a large block of data, it does lots and lots of computations with very highly optimized, very robust code, and then hands, hands you back the result, and you're only using Python or whatever it is for, to interface that code. And, and that's actually very good advice. You know, you, it, it, it's very hard uh, to write, especially in technical computing, to write very good uh, numerical libraries. It often requires uh, uh, specialized knowledge. And so it's very good to use existing code where possible. It's very hard to beat uh, you know, existing code for linear algebra or FFTs or you know, uh, uh, optimization or a lot of, uh, lot of uh, 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 well-known domains. But you know, eventually, you know, someone has to write those libraries. And so, up until now, the, that, those people bear the pain of, of writing it in C or, or Fortran. But eventually, if, if you do uh, 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 scientific computing for long enough, that person's going to be you. Because you know, some problems at some point are just impossible or, or very awkward to vectorize. That you, you, you have to write your inner loops yourself, and then you're stuck. You, you, you prototype, and then, then you write it in C. And, and uh, you know, I, I think many of us have had this experience in terms of competing, with, especially with students. You know, the, the students know MATLAB or know, they know Python, and they prototype it, they, they get it working. And then you tell them to rewrite it in C, and they've never written a C program any, uh, in their life, because uh, this is a physics graduate student. And uh, so a year later, after they've written it in C, and it's the first C program they've ever written, so it's, it's terrible C code. Like you have something, but there's this huge, huge delay well, if, if you, when, you, when you have to break the abstraction, when you have to break out of Python or break out of MATLAB. So the, the realization in the last couple decades has, has been, uh, uh, well, has been that dynamic languages don't have to be slow. Right? There, there's a lot of progress in, in JIT compilers and other kinds of things driven a lot by web applications. I mean, J JavaScript at this point is amazing, and they poured so many resources, resources into JavaScript compilers that it really achieves C-like speed. And so there's a lot of efforts to speed up other languages. Um, uh, certainly MathWorks is trying to speed up MATLAB, and a lot of people are trying to speed up Python with, for example, PyPy or uh, Numbar. Cython, I, I, I wouldn't really count, because that's, that's really a, a second lower level language that's embedded in Python. So the Julia, the idea behind it was, what, what if, you, if, if you started from the beginning now, you designed your language uh, for JIT compilation with the goal of, of being as high level as possible while still staying within a factor of, of two of C speed. And, and, and when I first heard of this, uh, and this is not started by me, this is started by Alan Edelman at MIT and uh, Jeff Bezentz and Viral Shah and Stefan Kar Karpinski, and I, I thought that they, uh, that, uh, they were crazy. Uh, so, uh, so, I mean, uh, my, my first reaction was that these, this is doomed, right? And, and I said, you know, no offense, guys. I, you know, I'm sure it's very nice, but all new languages are doomed, right? The, the number of languages that survive is basically a statistical error. So, uh, and, but, but, but uh, and so this was a very new language. You know, it was begun in 2009. The very first public release, point one release, was in 2013. Uh, it's currently nearing the point four release. Uh, there is about 24,000 uh, commits at this point. At this point, there's, it's quite a lively developer community. There's, there's 24 or more developers with uh, over 100 commits to the core, and there's also almost 600 published packages in their package system. They're having the second annual uh, Julia Khan in 2015. You know, so, so what happened is my first reaction was they're doomed. I got so excited about it that I upgraded this to probably doomed. And, and, and then since then, I've upgraded that to, it still might be doomed, right? But in the meantime, I'm having fun with it. And, and for me, it, it solves this, this two-language problem, um, which is a real problem for me that, I, 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 like I said, I keep encountering over, over and over again, and nothing else solves it to the same level with uh, high-level dynamic languages. And, uh, and uh, kind of perversely, uh, it's, it's actually easier to call SciPy from Julia than it is to call it from PyPy. So I don't know if you know, but PyPy basically can't call any, any C extension for, the, for C Python, so which includes uh, SciPy. So today, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to Julia and explain uh, what the key features, in particular, you know, why, why is it possible to get good performance in this, as a, and why is it easier to get good performance in, in this than it is in Python with something like Numba. Uh, but I'm also going to talk a, a, a lot about how Julia is really leveraging Python and IPython and Ju the Jupyter project, it's now called. 
um, to lessen this problem, the infrastructure problem of new languages, that when you switch to a new language, suddenly you lose everything that you've built up uh, in, in, in Python or, 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 or C or whatever you're coming from. So this is a, a dynamically typed language like, uh, like Python. Uh, or, or MATLAB or, or, or Perl or whatever. It has multiple, multiple dispatch uh, is, is what's built around. This is a kind of generalization of object-oriented programming. I'll explain what that is in a moment. It has built-in metaprogramming for code generation. Uh, very powerful metaprogramming. I won't have time to explain. It allows you to directly call C and Python functions without writing any wrappers. Uh, it has coroutines, asynchronous I.O., built-in Unicode, distributed memory memory parallelism. Uh, so, you know, one interesting thing is that almost all of Julia is actually written in Julia. In fact, like the built-in types, like integer arithmetic in Julia is written in Julia. So, uh, I mean, basically built-in types have no advantage over your, your own uh, types. If you define your own type, it's just as first class as an int or a float or any of, the, any of those, those other types. And it, it, it comes with a large built-in library similar to SciPy or MATLAB that has regex and linear algebra and special functions and integration, FFTs, all the things you'd expect in a scientific computing library. And it has a built-in package manager, which is actually based, on, based around Git. Uh, so, um, so the first thing we did to leverage Python is actually to leverage, uh, 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 leverage the interface. So nowadays in Python, you have this very nice modern multimedia interface provided by IPython, which provides notebooks, which makes code, results, graphics, rich text equations, and interaction. And fortunately, they, they put it together in a form that, that it's easy to use it for other languages as well. So, you know, how IPython works, if you've probably, how, how many people here have used IPython? Yeah, so most of you, you should definitely yeah, definitely look at it if you haven't used it yet. So it has a web browser interface, and you know there's a program which types in Python code, and then what it does is, it, is it's talking to a, a web server. Uh, um, it sends the code over o o over HTTP to the web server. The web server doesn't execute it. It sends it over a zero MQ channel to a kernel that executes it in Python, sends back the results, which might be text, might be graphics, whatever. The web server then formats it, sprinkles on some JavaScript, and sends it back to the browser for display. And so what you can do is you can just replace the kernel with a kernel from another language. And so uh, um, Julia was one of the first. Uh, so Fernando Perez, who founded the IPython project, uh, flew us out to Berkeley and, and had us uh, 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 hook our, uh, uh, our kernel in there, which they're now calling Jupiter because it's Ju is for Julia and Pi, Pi is for Python and the R is for R. So now they have backends for Julia, Python, R, Haskell, I think a whole bunch of languages, which we're calling iJulia is our kernel. And then suddenly you get all this interface for free. So let me just skip over to that. Right, so you, you, you have a, this, this notebook, interf you put notebook interface, you, and you open up a notebook, and a notebook looks like this. Okay, so you can mix, let me make this uh, full screen and make it a bit bigger. Right, it's too big. So you can mix code and results and equations and so forth. And so uh, it has links as well. So let me just give you a flavor. Uh, again, I'm not going to explain the syntax in great detail, but the flavor should be uh, familiar to anyone who has used MATLAB or NumPy. It's kind of very superficially similar. You know, all those, you know, there's, there, you can make a, a ma here's a random matrix, 10 by 300 matrix, and then I can take, uh, make a vector and take a backslash b to get the, uh, to get, to solve ax equals b, multiply a prime a, that's MATLAB notation for for, uh, for A transpose A, I can compute the eigenvalues and take the error functions of these and subtract something. I mean, this is just a random computation. And this, it does all the sort of vectors and linear algebra and special functions you, built, you expect. It has complex numbers, and, and this is uh, arbitrary precision arithmetic. This is big nums, so this is cosine of 3 plus 4i in and, and 80 digits of precision. It supports Unicode, so it has all the, this is a, a regex search. Uh, oh, here's a, here's a Unicode string. All, all, the, all the strings are Unicode by default in UTF-8 encoding. Uh, so there's a regex search. I'm going to search out the matches for a space followed by a letter, uh, 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 a lowercase letter, and it found, it found three matches. 
uh, in that. The variable names can be Unicode, much like in Python 3. So I can have a variable uh, named, uh, 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 I don't know if you can see it very well. Let's see. So I can have a variable named uh, 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 alpha sub 2 hat prime equals 7, h bar equals that, x dot equals that. You might w w wonder how, you, how do I enter a variable like that? That's the traditional problem with Unicode, right? So how do I variable, enter a variable x dot? Well, if only I could just type x dot. Right, plus uh, you know h bar tab, right? So you basically just type th those are the LaTeX abbreviations if people know LaTeX. And you just hit tab and it and it uh, it completes to the Unicode. So you can type in any. So now now once we implemented that, it was the easiest feature ever to implement. It's just a table of tab completions, and like suddenly everyone use, started using Unicode all over the place in, in in Julia. It's implemented in the editors, Emacs mode, and VI, and so forth. Implement the same tab completions. Uh, Py, IPython uh, saw that and they said we have to have that too. So the latest version of IPython also implements tab, Unicode uh, tab completion. Um, unlike Python, however, um, py, uh, so so uh, uh, um, the Unicode math operators, like for example, less much less than. Uh, or this is, this is uh, um, uh, O times uh, are parsed by Julia as infix operators. So I can define a new infix operator. I can say, so there's a function called cron for Kronecker products, which is a kind of matrix product. And I can define O times to be that. And then I can take two matrices and, and do an infix product. And it does, and now it's too big. Um, and, and uh, and I can just use it as an infix operator. So now you have like 100, Unicode has like 300 uh, uh, infix operators. Every, every math operator you might imagine, you know, a prox equal or whatever, uh, you know, much less than, much greater than, greater than or equal to. Well, of course, greater than or equal to is just defined as the greater than or equal to operator. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so you can define new infix operators using, uni using the Unicode symbols. So of course, you can define functions. And so here's where I'm starting to get into some performance issues. So, so, before, so, so we can define a function foo of x equals x, x plus one. So it's sort of vaguely MATLAB-like syntax. It's not, it's not indentation sensitive like Python. You say end to end the block. And there's also a, a one, for one short functions, you can just say foo x equals x plus one. There's also anonymous functions like lambda in Python. So I can define the function foo. And there's no, notice there's no types here, right? I, I don't define. I don't declare any types. It's a dynamic language. OK, so I can take foo of 3, and it computes 4. But what happens is the first time you call foo for a given type, so in this case an integer argument, uh, Julia JIT compiles a version of foo specialized for that. OK, and then the next time you call foo with an integer, it's, it's fast. Then if I call foo for a different argument, a floating point, it also works, right? It, it can add anything where the plus one is defined, it'll work. But now it compiles, now there are two versions cached in memory. And if I pass it for arrays, now there are three versions cached in memory. And so you can actually look at the code that it generates. So this is uh, the, uh, 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 at various stages of the compiler to see what it's doing. There's a code typed, I won't explain that, actually, which tells you the types that it infers. I'll explain that in a minute. I can look at code LLVM, which is so it's using LLVM for the compiler, um, and, and and this is the LLVM bytecode for calling foo of three. So and what it does is it just does a 64-bit addition. This is a 64-bit integer and returns the result. Basically, this is exactly what and, he, and he, actually here's the assembly language code. If you can read, anyone can read assembly language here. How many people can read assembly language? Can anyone? Not too many people these days, but yeah. So it, it, it pushes something on the stack, uh, uh, saves the stack, it, 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 uh, it uh, loads the, uh, 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 the integer, adds one to it, and pushes it back on, and that's, that's it. But basically, this is exactly what, if you wrote a C function, f of x equals x plus 1 for integers, this is exactly what the compiler would produce. Okay. And then if you look at a different version, of course, again, it's, this is for floating point. It calls the floating point instruction, that, which is, uh, uh, oops, that, that's the, that's, that's the not, uh, here's the native code. And it calls 
add SD, which is the floating point addition. And here's the version for complex numbers. And it's a little bit more complicated. It has to, complex numbers are a struct. It extracts the real part, adds one, and then writes it back out. But basically, this is, this is tight code. Right. Now, this is a little too trivial. Because, uh, you know, the, 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 f of x equals x plus 1 is such a simple function that in almost any language, a sufficiently smart compiler could produce good code uh, for that. Um, but uh, let me go back to, let's see. Yeah, so, 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 so I, I'm going to talk about why Julia is fast, but before that, I really need to do a little bit more work to convince you that Julia is fast. Because like I said, anything can compile x plus 1 to fast code, right? So there's a lot of ways you can do it, but I'm going to look at several benchmarks. So this is a, some benchmarks posted on the a Julie web page, and, and it has a bunch of different test problems, uh, um, in, in, and then it benchmarks them in a bunch of different languages. A normalized, and this is vertical axis is speed, higher is, so it's time, higher is worse, okay? And it's normalized, so C is one. So here, this line, horizontal line is C speed, okay? And you know, these are synthetic benchmarks. So, so Fib, for example, computes the, nth, the 20th Fibonacci number by just the obvious recursive code. And so a lot of people misunderstand these benchmarks. They say, well, if I were writing Fib 20 in Python, I wouldn't write it by recursion. I'd write it in some other way, right? But it, 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 the, the goal is not to benchmark the fastest way to write Fib, right? The goal is to benchmark whether you can use recursion in, 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 for inner loops in your language, right? If you want the 20th Fibonacci number, the absolute fastest way to write it in any, any language is just to hard code the a answer, right? The answer is Fib of 20 is not changing, right? So, so yeah, so basically this is it's just a question of whether you can use recursion in your inner loops. In, pi in an octave, it's 10,000 times slower than C. <laughs> MATLAB is also 10,000 times slower. R is 1,000 times slower than C. Mathematics is 100 times slower. Python is about almost 100 times slower than C, right? It, and this won't come as a surprise to any Python programmers, right? You know, you, you don't have like little tiny recursive functions in your inner loop. I mean, that's, you, you're crazy. But you know, Julia is basically C speed, right? And you know, it's, you know, sorting, and there's some there's some in here, and string processing, and and various other kinds of things, right? And there's some things where where Python. So on this one, this, this dot. Uh, um, basically, Python is fast, pretty fast. This is multiplying random matrices, but that's because it's calling a C library for the matrix multiplication. And so uh, basically, everything is fast for multiplying matrices because, because they're all calling the same libraries. Now, uh, these are all, people are always, uh, and, uh, you should be rightly dubious of those things because, you know, benchmarking little synthetic, you know, 15 line functions, uh, maybe the, you know, the compiler is smart enough for those, but what about real problems, right? Uh, where you're comparing not like toy problems, toy implementations to toy implementations, but real implementations that are highly optimized and mature and so forth. And uh, so, and, and there's a lot of experience that actually Julia does very well for those. So, for example, uh, in scientific computing, a classic thing is special functions. So special functions are like sine or cosine or Bessel functions or error functions. And these things, this is a classic problem that you can't vectorize well. Because the way you evaluate, I don't know if anyone knows how you evaluate like a sign on the computer, right? It, the way it does it, it, it does it is, it is you break the domain into different pieces. And in each, depending on what x is, and it, you break it into pieces. And for, in each little piece, you fit it to a polynomial, OK? So there's a different polynomial approximation or ratio of polynomials on each interval of x. And so for every x, you have to check what is x and then do a different polynomial. So there's no way to write that in terms of vectorized operations, where you have an array of x's, because for every x in that array, it's doing a different polynomial, right? So you know, if you look at SciPy, none of the special functions are implemented in Python. They're all implemented in C or Fortran. Uh, but in Julia, well, of course, where the, special, the existing one was good enough, we just called that. But some of the times we wrote our own. And so, for example, uh, I wrote uh, uh, an inverse of the error function. And Julia, don't, know, don't, don't, don't worry if you don't know what that is. Um, but it's pure, it's, it's about three times faster than MATLAB's implementation, which is presumably Fortran code. It's hard to tell what MATLAB is doing. And it's about two to three fi times faster than SciPy's, which is in the Fortran Cepheus library. And this should be puzzle you because, you know, and also there's a, a polygamma function I implemented which is d d twice as fast as SciPy's, but unlike SciPy's, the same code supports complex arguments, where SciPy's didn't support complex arguments. But because it's, it's type generic, you can write one code that supports both type of, types of arguments. 
and you know, this should puzzle you a little bit because you know, there's, there's no way that Julie in principle should be able to be faster than C, right? It's using LLVM. It's not use, it, the, the compiler back end is the same compiler back end as the C code, right? I mean, or it's LL, LLVM is certainly not, not you know, there's no magic there that's not available to C or Fortran. But what happens is that you know, if you're working in a high level languages, you can use tricks that, uh, um, that are possible to use in, in low-level languages, but they're really hard. And so in particular, this uses some metaprogramming techniques to spit out the like, optimized polynomials and completely inline them. Whereas it, uh, in, in the Fortran implementations, basically, you don't inline the polynomial evaluation. You call a subroutine library because it's just too much of a pain to inline things all over the place without code generation. And it's too much of a pain to write code generation in C or Fortran because you have to write a special purpose program. Whereas in a high-level language, it's no problem. So I've also looked at FFTs, which actually I implemented. I'm the author of a library called FFTW, uh, which, which is one of the main FFT, serious C FFT libraries. So I know something about this. Uh, I, I, this is like 100,000 lines of code. So, so with Julia, it doesn't do as well as that. Uh, um, but it, it does as well as, about as well as FFT pack with about a third of the number of lines of code. But let me skip on. Let me show you an even simpler example that everyone here can, can understand completely what it's doing which is a real example. This is in, in NumPy as well. Uh, um, so this is generating Vandermond matrices. So given an X, an array of some numbers, alpha 1, alpha 2, and so forth, you want to generate a matrix. The first column is 1. The second column is X. The, second, the third column is the element of X squared. And you're just taking the elements of X and just uh, 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 taking them to powers for each of the columns. This is a very important matrix for lots of things in linear algebra. OK, and there's a built-in function in NumPy called numpy.vander that does this. And so we can look at what it, how that works. OK, so let me, let me pull that up. So this is the, this is the actual implementation uh, in, in NumPy. It's pretty, it's pretty easy to read. It reads it, so I, I've skipped the comments. But basically, it's a function of x. Uh, um, so you first make sure it's an array. It checks that it's a one-dimensional array, otherwise it throws an error. Uh, so some argument checks here. And then it, check, it does some type promotion to figure out what the type of the result should be. So it says promote types, and the, it started with an int and whatever the type of x is. And then it has a couple of different cases, but then all the work is done in, in a function called multiply accumulate. So it initializes the first, the first column uh, of v to, to, to ones or to x's. Okay, and then it does multiply, or the last column, and, and, then, and then this calls this multiple, multiply accumulate. That multiply accumulate function is uh, written is here. It's written in C. Pi u func accumulate. Okay, and this is already getting quite long and complicated. Right, that's pretty long. A pretty long function for just for something that just it's just a multiply accumulate. It just just it just loops through and multiplies each thing by the previous one. Right? And actually, this is not doing the multiplications. All of this code is just to check the types and implement type genericness uh, uh, over the types of arrays and over the types of the arguments. Okay, so it's just a, there's a whole bunch of checks to see what's the type of array you have. Is it aligned? What's the type of the elements? And so forth. And then after all that, it figures out what kernel it should use. And the kernel, then it calls this code. And this is not even C code. This is a template for C code that they then is then used to generate. There's you know 15 different C functions that are, that are generated from this that does the actual loop for different argument types. And so it's fast. It's type. So this is type generic code, but at the low level, it only supports a, a, a small number, a set of types that are you know 32-bit integers, 64-bit integers, floating point, and so forth. Okay. So in contrast, here's an implementation in Julia. Okay, uh, very short, very easy to understand. Right, so I, I, I pass in x. Since I'm going to declare a type here, but it's not for performance. It's to say that this is a filter. Remember, in the Python code, I had a type check. I'm just going to give it an argument type. Say this only. A, I, I only accept 1D arrays or some some abstract type of 1D array. Okay, of some type t, uh, any type t you want, and the output array is going to be an array of the same type. Okay, I could also promote it if I want, uh, and then I. I, I loop over the first column, initialize it to one, whatever the appropriate one is for that type. I could just use the number one here for all the numeric types, but this is very generic here. This could be some 
abstract element type represents some group or something like that that has some abstract one element. So this is just the function that returns the one for that. And then I just loop to have two nested loops over the array and just accumulate this, these products. Right? And of course, you could do this in Python as well, but it would be insanely slow to have two nested loops of multiplications have, your, have that be your inner loops. And if you look at the performance of this, this is the NumPy time divided by the Julia time as a function of n, this matrix size. And so, the, so, so, uh, so the here, the, so, so if it's bigger than 1, it means the NumPy is slower. So for very small arrays, NumPy is 10 times slower, because basically the overhead of all of that type checking and all, all, all that C code, and so, uh, 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 it does all that setup, setup before it actually solves the problem, um, kills you. For big arrays, it's fast, but it's no faster than Julia. Julia that simple thing is, 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 is just as good as that very complicated implementation, real implementation in, in NumPy. And there's nothing wrong with that implementation in NumPy. That's how things were done, right? But uh, I mean, it, it's, it's an amazing opportunity that you can get this kind of speed with this kind of short code for, and then this is a real problem. This is something that people actually need these kinds of things. Okay, so, so why, why is it fast? And I convinced you it really is fast, or at least it can be fast. Of course, you can write slow code in Julia. You can write slow code in any language. Um, but the, the nice thing about Julia is, is, is there are very predictable, you can look at a piece of code and there are very predictable rules about what makes it fast, what makes it slow. It's not some kind of magic in the compiler that if, it's, if, if you've written code in a special form, somehow it's magically fast. And if it's slow, who knows what's happening. OK, and, and, and couldn't you do the same thing in Python? And certainly Numba is an attempt to do the same thing in Python. But I think it faces more obstacles than Julia does, which is, and it's amazing how, how well they actually do. And the, the key technique in both, uh, there's a lot of little things you know, here and there, but the key technique in both Numba and Python is basically aggressive specialization of functions on different argument types. So like I said, each time you call a function, it compiles a specialized version for those types. Okay? And the, the, the real question is, how does the compiler know the types? So when I say f of 3, of course, it knows that 3 is an integer. But how does it know the types inside f? And this is a problem called type inference. Okay, so given, you know, you have some function f of x, y. To generate fast code, the compiler needs to be able to infer the types of all the variables in f, map them to hardware types, ideally registers, uh, uh, um, call specialized code paths for those types, and do this recursively. So if, if, if f of x calls any other functions, it needs to be able to, you know, figure out what the type of that is and compile those and so forth. And the, the, the key thing is that at compile time, the compiler doesn't know the values of the arguments. It, it only knows the types of the arguments that you pass in. And so it's somehow, given only the types, it needs to be able to cascade this information to confer all the types throughout f and recursively in any functions that it calls. And so basically, Julia, the key thing is that the, the language and the standard library are designed so to make type inference possible for any code that follows straightforward rules. And, and, and sometimes this requires you know, very subtle choices in language design, library design, that will be very difficult to retrofit onto an existing language. So if you have an existing language, it's very hard to undo those choices. So, and, and one of the key things is something called type stability. So in, to, to get predictable, understandable type inference, basically you, functions should satisfy this property. The, 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 the type of the return value should only depend on the types of the arguments, not the values. So for example, a counterexample in MATLAB is square root. So the square root of 1 in MATLAB gives you 1.0, a, a real floating point value. The square root of negative 1 gives you 0 plus 1i, a complex floating point value. But that means that the, 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 the type of the return depends on the value of the argument, not just on the type. Right? So given an integer or a real number, it has to know whether it's positive or negative. And so that means any code that calls square root of x in MATLAB can't be called the fast, compiled the fast code, even if x is known to be a real scalar. Or it's very hard to compile it because anything touched by this, the return value is then poisoned. It doesn't know the, return, the type of that uh, and so forth, unless the compiler can somehow prove that x is, is, is non-negative. Now, what it can do is it can compile two branches of the code, one if, if it was a real or one if it was complex. But if you have several of these functions, you quite very quickly get an exponential explosion in the number of code paths. But then what you can do is something like Python, PyPy does, which is a tracing jet. You can try and run it many times to statistically identify what's the most common code paths 
the, the problem with, with, with that is, it, 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 basically, you, it, it's, it's, you, you, as the compiler gets more and more magical, it's, it's much harder to predict whether you're, you're going to get good performance or not. And if it doesn't get good performance, it's very hard to fix it. All right. So the, the right thing to do is to throw an exception if you give it. Give it. And, and so that if, if you actually want a complex result, you have to give a complex input. And that's what Python does, actually. So Python did the right choice here for, compile, for, for designing a squared interface. Unfortunately, there's other examples in Python where it didn't make the right choice. So for example, integer exponentiation, 2 to the 2 returns 4, but 2 to the minus 2, two returns 0.25. And this is an integer, this is floating point value. So, Again, you know, to, if you have integer to an integer where it doesn't know that the, that the exponent is positive or negative, uh, suddenly the type, it, it, it doesn't know. And so in Julia, this throws an exception. If you, want, if you want a floating point result, you have to give it a floating point input. Another example that's even more pervasive in Python is all integer arithmetic. So Python guarantees that integer arithmetic will never overflow. So if you add one over and over and over again, right, it, it will eventually switch. It starts out with machine integers and switches over to big numbers automatically. So basically, so technically in Python 3, there's only one type of integer, but it has two internal representations, which is basically the same thing. right? And so, so basically, that means unless the compiler can detect that overflow is impos impossible, which is sometimes possible. If you have a loop for i equals 1 to, to, you know, to 1,000, right, it knows that i will never overflow. Right? But, but it's not always possible. Then integers can't be compiled to, to, to stick into registers and can't, and can't be fast. So what the Julia makes a trade-off is that it allows overflow. The default integers are 64-bit, so overflow is possible. Um, but you know, in practice, if you have a 64-bit integer, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your integer is representing anything in the real world, like uh, any count of any object in the real world, count of bytes or a count of loop iterations and so forth, you will never overflow a 64-bit integer. So thank you, 64-bit computing. This is not true in 32 bits, right? But 64-bit, you will never overflow. The only time you'll ever overflow is if you're basically you're doing number theory, right? If you're competing you know, a, a thousand factorial or, 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 or doing, you know, RSA cryptography or something like that, then you have, you have thousand digit integers, integers. But you know if you're doing number theory, right? And if you're doing number theory, you use a, a big int. Uh, there is a big int type, so you switch types. So you can say, well, why not just add t some type of declarations to your code to tell it, oh, this is really an int64. And this is this fallback approach. This is, you know, what N Numba does. If, it, if, if type inference fails, you can sprinkle some type declarations in. And, and, there's just a couple of problems. So the main problem, I think, with that is the code is no longer type generic, right? And this is a, the, the nice thing about working in a high-level language is, is, is I could, the same code could work with any type. This Vander code that I wrote originally worked with any type, any arithmetic type that had a multiplication and a one, right? That, that's all it cares about. Um, so I, I can declare types in Julia if I want. Uh, I, I can say this is only for vectors of flow 64 and so forth, and then it's not, and it's only 1.0. This, this works, but there's no performance advantage, right? The, the only reason I declare types and arguments in Julia is, to, is a filter saying, I want to do this function for this type and some other function for another type. I, you know, the, uh, another problem is typically you only support, uh, 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 the compiler only supports a small subset of types. So, it, it, so NumPy has a small set of types that, you, that, that, that are fast. You can also make, I think you called it records of these types, like a struct basically, but those structs are not sort of full-fledged Python types. You can't, you can't define like a new quaternion type, and I mean, you couldn't define a quaternion type that has four numbers, but you can't like, overload the, the uh, uh, like times and plus and do all the, all the object things you would want to do with, Py, with, with, with a new Python type with, with those types. So you, you're really restricted in, 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 to a set of types that the compiler knows about. And it's also just annoying to write. You know, it's a, we, we're, we're, we're not using Python or Julia or whatever it's, it, 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 because we love having type declarations all over the place. Right. So, so, okay, so, um, yeah, so, so, so that's, that's sort of why it can be fast. And let me skip back to the, let's see, where's the, there it is, okay. So, and, and, and talk a little bit about uh, is, is some more, uh, 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 you know, a couple more things of Julia, okay? And in particular, well, let me, let me do two, focus on two things. So, I'll quickly say what multiple dispatch is. So, this is, this is sort of the central thing in uh, abstraction in Julia. So, in, in, in a typical object-oriented language like Python, you have an object type, and that sort of owns certain methods, right? So, you have... Uh, object.method arg1 arg2. 
So, and depending on the type of the object, the runtime system will, will dynamically dispatch uh, to, to you know, different, different actual implementations of that, of that method, right? So in Julia, you, would, you can do the same thing, but you would spell it differently, right? You would write, spell it as method object one, arg one, arg two. Okay, so, but it's, it's just a different spelling of the same thing. But why, why spell it that way? Well, if you spell it that way, you suddenly see there's something funny about uh, 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 this, which is that the, the object is just the first argument of this, right? Why should that be the magic thing that owns the method, right? Why not, why not all the arguments? And so, for example, uh, 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 um, if you have a, a, a binary operation like times, x times y, right? It, it's very unnatural for the, the first argument to own that, right? What the, what the times operation is should depend on both of the arguments. And so this is, the, 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 the implementation of this idea is called multiple dispatch. So in, in multiple dispatch, um, basically, whenever you call a method like this, it doesn't just look at the first one to, to, to dispatch it, it looks at all the arguments and dispatches the most specific method defined for all those argument types. So for example, if I look at times, in Julia, I can type methods times to get a list of all the methods defined. So there's, there's different methods for, for times two booleans, or number times a boolean, or complex numbers, or matrix types, very specialized matrix types. Flow 64, here's, here's complex arithmetic. I can click on this. this oh, my network is working. And here's the implementation for complex arithmetic. It's very straightforward. <laughs> this is the usual product of complex numbers that, that you, you, you see in mathematics. So it's all implemented in Julia, that, and that's fast. Um, and so, so, but, but, I can, but these, these methods aren't really owned by the types. I can, they're, 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 they're sort of free-floating things. So for example, if I do, um, uh, so there actually is a times method for strings. So string concatenation in Julia is times. No, uh, uh, um, but suppose you like plus better, right? And so plus is not does not, uh, 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 is not defined. There's no method matching plus of two, two, two strings. So I can just define one. So I can, I, I, I can, I don't have to define the methods at the time that I create the, the type. I can define them and add them at any time. So I can, I can say import plus from base. I, you have to import an existing method to extend it as opposed to overwrite it. And then I'll define a plus operation that concatenates the strings and puts a space in the middle. And now, plus has 118 methods instead of 117. And now if I do hello plus world, it, it'll concatenate it, then I'm put a space. Okay, and this is not the same as C++ overloading. In C++ overloading, you can define multiple methods for different types, but that's done statically, right? You can't, you can't define, a pass a function at runtime and have it dispatch on that. Whereas this can be, you can take the plus, now that we've defined plus, we can pass it into an existing function, like sum, that uses the plus, and now that I've defined plus, this will work. I, I, I just concatenated a whole bunch of, bunch of words. Okay, so let me... The, the main drawback of going to new languages is that you lose... Is, is that you have a, big, a huge investment in, in your existing code base. Right? So Julia tries to lessen that uh, as much as possible. So, so there, there are built-in in constructs to call C code. So if I want to call C code, I don't need to write a wrapper or use swig or something like that. I just say C call, uh, I'll call the printf function. Now C code, it, you know, it, it, this is just a function standard library. It doesn't know what the types are, so I have to tell it. The return type is an integer. The, uh, uh, the argument is a pointer to, to, to bytes. I'll pass it a string, and it will automatically do, do the appropriate conversions and actually print hello world, and that's captured, and, and it returns the number of bytes the, the, the number of bytes written, I think, is what the return value printf is. And so I can also call functions in DLLs. Here I'll call the sign function in libm, which is the math library. And I'll call it my sign. That takes a double argument, returns a double, and of course and I, I can vect, write a vector version of it and then call, uh, 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 oops, let me just scroll up, and call my sign on a vector, and it calls sign of each of those things. And, 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 of course, you, you can call C functions in, in DLLs directly with Python, too, using C types, right? Or there's various FFI things in Python. There, but there's, there's a difference. Uh, so, so that's superficially similar to that. You, you basically tell it what the types are, and then it, it, it handles the calling, the marshalling, and so forth for you. Um, the, the difference is that you, you, you know, because the Python being what it is, you can't call C functions in your inner loops, right? So when, for example, so I wrote the error function that's used in, in, in SciPy. 
um, the complex error function. And so the easiest thing we would do would be write a three-line wrapper with C types that just calls that, right? But you can't do that because, because then, then basically if you want to call the error function an array, you'd have to write a loop in Python that loops over the array and then calls the C function on each iteration. So in practice, a lot of times to call C functions, you have to still have to write a wrapper routine, and SciPy did this for my error function, that basically takes in, it's a C function, but takes in an array, a Python array, and it knows about the different numby array types, and then does the loop in C calling my function and calls back out. So, so suddenly what becomes, a, should be a trivial thing, suddenly becomes, a, you have to write this big wrapper machinery to, just to call a, a, a little C function. So you can also call Python from Julia. So on top of this, so Python, the C Python is just a, a C library called libpython. And, uh, and that's when, when you run Python code, that's all it's calling out to. So you can call that directly from external C code, and since Julia can call C, you can call that directly, and I wrote a little package called py, PyCall that does that, and I can, then I can just import any Python uh, module I want. I don't have to write wrappers. I just say can import math as PyMath and call PyMath cosine, okay? And it's just calling via uh, 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 um, libpython directly. So there's basically no overhead to this, no more overhead than there would be to calling this in Python. And so, for example, when you pass uh, arrays, I can convert into a pi object. Uh, uh, all the Julia types and the Python types, almost all of them are, can be passed, converted back and forth automatically. And big data structures like arrays and dictionaries are passed actually as shared objects. So you pass a big array, it shares, it shares memory. And, and so I can pass an array, I can import NumPy as MP and call IRR. I can pass it an array and call IRR, which is some kind of financial function. Um, that does, I don't know what it does, but it, it, it takes this array and, and, it pass, and, and computes something and returns the value, but I'm, it, 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 I'm not passing a copy of the array. So if I have gigabytes of data, I don't need to make a copy uh, to call it. And, and dictionaries are also shared and everything like that. And, and uh, you can also pass Julia functions to Python. So here's a function foo x equals x plus one, our favorite Julia function, right? And I can convert that into a Python object, and I can call that well, for, from Python. Now, let me show you a, a better example. So, so where, where would you want to pass functions? So there's it, basically in any, any, any interface where you pass callback routines, like optimization uh, is the typical thing. So there's, there's, uh, in SciPy, there's an optimize module called scipy.optimize. You pass it a function f of x, and it will find the maximum, minimum, or the root. Okay? And, and so here I'll define f of x to be cosine x minus x. And in Julia, and I'll pass it to SciPy, and it will call, and, and, and then, and then it will call back to Julia automatically uh, uh, um, to uh, basically to, to find the root of this function. And the reason this works is because Julia functions can be compiled to machine code by the JIT compiler, and th that's what Python at the C Python level needs for a callback. It actually needs a C function pointer, and Julia can provide that that just a pointer to machine instructions uh, to that, and. Another example is you can call matplotlib. So I just here they call it plot. I make a lin space. I call plot x sine x and so forth. You get the title, and I can do all of all of matplotlib. I can make a, a surface plot and so forth, which is really nice because basically it's really hard to write a full feature plotting library, and everything is available. So there's a function in matplotlib called xkcd to make xkcd style plots. Uh, here's another example calling uh, scikit image, which does image processing, and which uses matplotlib. And I'm just, I'm just pi importing it, doing subplot. It, 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 basically, it's just, I didn't write wrappers manually for all of these functions. It just calls them directly in Python and, and, and spits out the result, and it knows how to get the images to do thresholding and, and all of that kind of stuff. So I think I'm about out of time. So let me. Uh, concludes. So, so basically, this is this is fun. It's fast. You know, new languages are always a risk, right? This is this is for early developers. You know, it, it, it hasn't had a 1.0 release yet. You won't know for 10 years whether this has really uh, succeeded, right? And whether this is around to stay. But you know, it, it's. I think it's a very promising thing, and you don't lose all of your Python stuff by switching over to Julia. So let me let me thank especially the core Julia developers and Alan Edelman, and also the IPython developers were really instrumental in helping us out. And concluding with an advertisement, tomorrow I'm giving a two-hour uh, workshop where I actually will explain how the syntax works uh, at NCCU Pi Day. So thank you, thank you very much.